Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Joe Sanford. I am a professor at UW Platteville in the School of Ag. I'm also associated with the Wisconsin Dairy Innovation Hub. Um, and so today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ongoing research we have going into adding biochar into manure management. And so before we start getting into it too much, um, what is biochar for those of you who may not be as familiar with it? Um, biochar is a product of a process called pyrolysis, uh, where essentially we're, we're just taking a biomass. It can really be any organic biomass, wood chips, corn stover, straw, manure, putting it into a reactor with um, low oxygen content at very high temperatures. We're talking 600 and 900 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. And out of this process, what we end up with is a syngas and a bio oil. Uh, both of these products can be used for energy production or heating. Um, and then we end up with a biochar as well, um, which is this charcoal looking material down here. Here's some material that's been made in our lab um, from a lot of different things. And so biochar has a lot of interesting characteristics, um, very similar to activated carbon, not the same thing, but does have some similar characteristics. It has a very high carbon content, uh, has a high surface area, alkaline pH, and generally has a a fairly good exchange capacity with nutrients and other elements. And so biochar has been around for quite a while, um, and it's been primarily used as a soil amendment. Um, and so biochar has been applied to a lot of different types of soils, a lot of different production systems. Um, and you know, the kind of conclusions from a lot of the research you can find out there is that it's been shown to help improve nutrient retention. This is a, a study that was done by a graduate student in my old lab at UW-Madison with Becky Larson that found that um, soils amended with biochar uh, that received manure application. If we amended it with biochar, we could see significant reductions in total nitrogen leaching, significant reductions in, in nitrate leaching as well. It's also been found to increase um, water use efficiency in, in sandier soils, increase aeration, um, and porosity in, in more clay soils. Um, some studies have found it to reduce soil emissions. I put a little asterisk there because the, the research isn't really conclusive yet. There's a lot of different opinions on this right now. Um, but a big one that's receiving a lot of attention right now is biochar's potential to sequester carbon. And so um, if you're in, in ag, I'm sure you've heard about all the carbon credits going around, anaerobic digestion, things like that. Carbon sequestration is a is becoming a hot topic, and um, agriculture is kind of seen as, as the place for biochar and this uh, quest to sequester carbon is kind of the place for that biochar to go. And so one thing my research group has been looking at is, yes, it, it'd be nice to apply biochar to sequester carbon, improve nutrient retention, things like that. But how else might we be able to use biochar in a manure management system to get more benefits out of the product? And so what my research group at uh, Platteville has been doing uh, has been looking at different areas that we can add biochar into the manure management system. Uh, one of these areas is compost. This is probably one of the most studied areas when it comes to waste management and biochar is composting. Um, biochar has been found to have um, some benefits in composting, particularly around nitrogen retention in the form of nitrogen in the compost. Um, we've also seen out of Europe quite a bit of research into actually incorporating biochar into animal feed as well. Um, right now, I'm not actively looking into those. There's some literature out there I'd be happy to share with anyone that's interested. Um, but my re research group right now has been looking at actually using that manure from manure solids. So if we have solid liquid separator, we're separating out those solids, taking those solids, drying them down, and converting them into biochar as a another potential export from the farm. Um, we've also been looking at using it as a cover on the top of manure storages, and also incorporating it into anaerobic digestion systems. And so for the rest of my, my time, I'm gonna talk a little bit about these, these different studies that we have ongoing and some of the preliminary results we've been seeing. So making 
biochar out of manure. Um, this was a project that I started on uh, back at uh, in UW at UW Madison with Becky Larson, um, looking at phosphorus management in Wisconsin and and biochar. And um, for those of you who may not are in most states where we have a lot of uh, livestock production, a lot of CAFOs, we, we have an issue where you know, we have a concentration of animals, we have a concentration of manure, and generally around the farmstead that manure is being applied. And in particular in Wisconsin, we have a lot of issues with the buildup of phosphorus in that soil, leading to some legacy phosphorus issues. Um, and so a lot of research has gone into how can we better manage our manure phosphorus, um, particularly in areas where we have high concentrations of animals. Uh, quite a few studies have come out of uh, the UW-Madison groups, kind of looking at different areas of concern and different methods. And the conclusion for it is, is that really we need to find a way to help densify the phosphorus in manure and try to export it from some watersheds where we have a particularly high amount of livestock production. Um, and so solid liquid separation is one way to get a little bit of phosphorus out. A lot of studies have found that it's still a little too wet for economically transporting um, fairly significant distances. And so what we've been looking at is taking that manure solid, densifying it through the biochar or the pyrolysis process, and then shipping that out potentially as an as a agronomic fertilizer. And so here's some uh, results that we published a couple of years ago on this um, topic here. So the figure up here, um, in my lab, I have this little tiny biochar unit. This was the material that went into the biochar, the same mass, and this is what came out. And so you can see here, there's a really large reduction in the volume of that material. There's a large reduction in the mass of that material. Well, that makes it a little bit more feasible than to potentially transport further distances. And so what we wanted to look at in the first part of this study was what happens to the nutrients in the material. And so the figure on the left here, this is the phosphorus concentration. This is kind of what we were targeting here to see how we could densify the phosphorus. Um, taking the manure, drying it, and then going to biochar at two different temperatures, what we found was that we could really increase or densify that phosphorus into this biochar product. When we did a mass balance through the system, um, we essentially lost no phosphorus. So we retained about 100% of the phosphorus. There's a little bit of losses, probably from user error, um, but we retained all that phosphorus. And so we were able to densify that phosphorus from the manure solids into a very lightweight product that could potentially then be shipped out. On the nitrogen side of things, we did also see a densification in terms of nitrogen in the product. So in terms of pounds of nitrogen per ton um, of wet weight, uh, we did see more nitrogen in that material. However, if you did a mass balance here, what we found is we lost about 40 to 60% of the nitrogen when it went through pyrolysis. And this is primarily due to volatilization of, of nitrogen um, off of that process. And so right now we're kind of looking at, um, you know, yeah, we can densify the phosphorus. What does that mean though, if we use it then as a, as a fertilizer somewhere else? So we did a small incubation study. This is just some results from that, looking at phosphorus available, phosphorus in some soil incubation studies over time. What we found was that compared to the regular manure solids, there's a little bit of a lag in the biochar in terms of available phosphorus first, but over time it was statistically the same. All right, over the growing season. So right now what we're doing is we're transitioning some larger field studies to keep exploring. Uh, this is an option and get some more data and um, seeing how we can incorporate into some of our uh, production systems in Wisconsin. The next area I wanna talk about adding uh, biochar to manure systems is uh, manure storages. Um, and so manure storages, um, they're essential to a lot of our operations, particularly large operations. Um, however, there are some concerns, particularly around emissions. So our manure storages are going to emit quite a bit of methane. They're going to emit some nitrous oxide and also some ammonia. We're, we're going to have some nitrogen losses from that manure storage. Um, and so changes in the industry, particularly water use, has resulted in manure storages looking less like this and more like this, not having this natural crust. And what we've seen is that particularly ammonia emissions have increased when we have no crust on the surface. And so what we wanna look at is, can we use biochar as a surface cover over these more liquidy storages to help reduce particularly ammonia emissions and maybe some greenhouse gases as well? 
And so we've been working on some pilot studies here about to transition to some larger scale studies. Um, and so what we found is we had our manure storages, which were five gallon buckets, essentially. We filled them with manure. We had some controls. We applied covers over the top of this. So this is some wood chips that were not processed into biochar, some wood chips that were. And we measured ammonia emissions on a weekly basis and also greenhouse gas emissions on a weekly basis to kind of tracked what the emissions were. And what we found was pretty stark in terms of emissions of ammonia from that control. Wood chips, we also did a corn stover. Those two covers did reduce ammonia emissions, but when we added biochar into the mix, we took that material, made it into biochar. For wood chips, we almost eliminated ammonia emissions off that storage. And for a corn stover, we had a fairly large reduction as well. And so what was going on here, uh, what we kind of found is that that cover stability is really important. So biochar is fairly hydrophobic for the most part. Um, and what we saw was that the cover staying on the surface of that bio of that manure storage was really essential. And so this is the storages initially. This is like two or three days after we applied the cover. Here we see both covers, you know, on top. But after about a month, that that biomass started to sink. However, biochar was still pretty much just as good as it was on day one. And so this is what we think was the primary driver here. I mean, this has been a complaint of producers that do use permeable covers as a, as a mechanism for ammonia where they, they sink and they have, they require frequent reapplication. So biochar really does seem to be a potential method to reduce the applications of that permeable cover um, and help reduce ammonia emissions. The next topic I want to talk about um, is adding biochar to um, anaerobic digestion systems. Uh, this is an area that uh, I've gotten a lot of questions about recently. Um, and so for those of you in the room, I'm sure you're familiar with anaerobic digestion of manure. We're taking the manure, we're putting it in a reactor, we're getting biogas, we convert that into energy. There's a lot of benefits on the digestate side as well. However, a major problem with um, anaerobic digestion and particularly dairy manure is that we feed a lot of sulfur to our animals. And that sulfur, when it gets in this anaerobic condition, turns into hydrogen sulfide through um, sulfur reduction. And so hydrogen sulfide is a, is a really costly part of the operational budget for removing. It takes around 15 to 20% of your animal operation budget is put just towards removing hydrogen sulfide so that we can use that biogas for some sort of energy purpose. And so what we've been doing, this is, this is um, kind of coming off of some work that had been done by Becky Larson at Madison, um, expanding upon that, but I was looking at adding biochar to anaerobic digestion systems. Quite a few people have looked at this in terms of reducing methane, but we wanted to look at and see what its impact was on hydrogen sulfide. And so in our lab, we've been looking at multiple different types of biochars and adding them in batch reactors, and then analyzing the hydrogen sulfide, methane, and the biogas quantity off these reactors when we add biochar into the reactors at relatively low um, ratios in terms of a mass ratio. And what we found has been pretty uh, stark removal of, of biochar of hydrogen sulfide. And so this is from a study my undergrad finished up about uh, two months ago um, at UW Platteville. And what we did in this study is we had controls, which were just manure with some digestate from a local farm. And then we added bio biochars produced at different temperatures, starting around the lower end of what we consider biochar production to the higher end, and looked at hydrogen sulfide production over the course of the period. And what we found was that by adding biochar, particularly low temperature biochars, we could significantly reduce hydrogen sulfide production. When we did a mass balance of hydrogen sulfur produced compared to the biogas produced as well. Uh, we found we had around a, a 70 to 80% reduction when we added biochar in the range of 660 degree Fahrenheit to 930. When we get to that higher temperature, we're still trying to figure out what exactly is going on here. So I'm not going to have answers to that questions if they're out there. Um, but high temperature biochars are not great at reducing hydrogen sulfide. And we've seen this with a couple other biomasses as well. So this is some aspen wood. Um, really not having much effect, very similar to control. Um, so we're not 100% sure what's happening here, but the results that we've gotten so far has really shown that low temperature biochars are very effective at mitigating hydrogen sulfide production during anaerobic digestion of, of livestock manure.
So that is what I wanted to talk about today in terms of um, biochar and adding it to manure management systems. Um, just a few take home messages here. Um, you know, biochar has been shown to have a lot of potential as a soil amendment. And kind of what my group has been looking at is how can we increase the uses of it in manure management so that there's maybe some more adoption of it. And so we're looking at a lot of different things um, and a lot of different benefits that biochar could potentially have in these manure management systems. And I think a key takeaway from what I talked about today is that not all biochar is the same. Uh, the temperature, the feedstock that the bio biochar is produced at is important on your end goal. And so recognizing that when you are thinking about adding biochar, or thinking about encouraging a producer to add biochar to their manure management system is important. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about, uh, which I'm sure there will be questions on, is the cost. And so it's kind of the elephant in the room. Biochar production is going to be a fairly high cost, particularly if we're trying to do it on farm. Uh, it's going to be a high capital investment to put in a biochar pr production system on farm. However, I think with the carbon credits and the, and the way we're seeing anaerobic digestion moving right now, I think in the near future, there may be some incentives to start thinking about this biochar and, and lowering the cost a little bit. And so with that, I just want to say thank you. Here's my contact information. If you'd like to... Uh, uh, shoot me an email or follow me on Twitter. And the research I present today has been uh, funded both by the Dairy Hub in Wisconsin and uh, the USDA NEFA program.